So this morning I'm continuing on our World Overcoming Faith series. We're on part four and we're continuing on growing your faith. And we started on growing your faith last week and I'm going to continue today as well. So our foundational scripture has been 1 John 5, 4, which is, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So when God gave you His faith, He gave you victory over the world. So whatever's in the world, all the trouble, all the darkness, all the challenges, God has given you His faith to overcome that. Say, I am an overcomer. Amen. So some of the points we touched on the past three weeks, we said, number one, every born-again believer has faith. We discovered and we showed you through scripture there. And then number two, we said you need to wake up your faith. In other words, stop waiting for God to do something about it. You wake up your faith and, 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 and rebuke the storm. And then we said, number three, that every uh, faith always has a good report. Never a negative report. Faith always speaks in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the wall still up, it will say, I have the victory. And then last week, we looked at growing your faith, and we started with the first point saying that grow, you grow your faith that you already have through hearing the word. You grow your faith by hearing the word. So the scripture that I gave for that was 2 Thessalonians 1.3, which says, Paul said, we are bound to thank God always for you. Amen. Brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So your faith can grow exceedingly, and your love for others can abound. So say that my faith is growing exceedingly, and my love for others is abounding. Amen. So how do you grow your faith? We said, number one, last week, you grow your faith through hearing the word. And number two, I'm going to continue tonight, today. And um, you grow your faith through believing the word. Through believing. We sang many songs this morning about believing. We believe what God said about me. We believe what God has already promised us. We believe. So you grow your faith by believing. It's one thing to hear the word. It's another thing to believe what you hear. It's another thing completely separate. So you became a Christian through hearing and believing the word. Amen. Did you know that? You became somebody, you heard somebody preach about the word and faith came and then you believed it and then you acted on it and then you received Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. You believe that he died. You believe that he rose again and then you received him. You acted on it by by saying, yes, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you are my Savior and my Lord, and you made him your Lord and Savior only through believing and speaking. Well, that same principle, I'll show you the scripture for that now. You can apply to finances, your marriage, your family, your business, your employment, whatever it is you're facing. You can apply the same principle by believing in your heart, speaking with your mouth, and it will become exactly what you believe and say. Amen. So Romans 10, 8 to 10 says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So the word faith is near you. Word is near you. If it's faith, if it's the word, then it's faith is there. You don't, the word is near you. You don't need to go to America to get it. You don't need to go somewhere else. The word is near you. Where is it? It's in your heart and it's in your mouth. That is how you can receive anything from God. You don't need to go far up there and down there and all over the place looking for faith. Faith is there. It's near you. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. So it's called the word of faith because when we preach on the word, faith comes. Faith comes when you preach on the word. That's why it's called the word of faith. And so when you hear the word, faith comes. And you know, the best revelation I discovered of the word flows best when you are in a church setting or in a meeting where the word is being preached. When you are in that setting, revelation flows so much stronger, so much better. Why? Because you are in a corporate setting. There is faith in a corporate setting. There is power of God is flowing in a corporate setting. That is why Hebrews 10, 25 says, do not neglect the gathering of the saints. Because when you come together as saints, 
there's so much more power that flows. So, for example, when you are sitting corporately, the anointing is in this place. I might not be preaching directly about your situation, but because you're in this place right now, the anointing is beginning to bring answers to your situation that I might not even be talking about it, but answers are coming. Wisdom comes. Direction comes. Or one thought from God, one word from God can change your situation. That is why we must not neglect the gathering of the saints as is the habit of some. They, some people have a habit of not gathering with the saints. So we don't come to church so we can tick on our box, the religious box, I went to church. No, we come to church because we want to hear from heaven. We want mountains to move. Your faith might be weak today, but because you come in here and you're sitting next to or you're sitting in a setting where there's other people, their faith might be strong today. And their faith will assist your faith in receiving your breakthrough. Instead of sitting at home trying to figure out the problem and you study the problem and you study the problem and you study. Imagine if you're in a dark room. What's the first thing you look for when you're in a dark room? You look for light. You don't study the darkness, study the darkness, study the darkness. No, you head for light. And once you get to the light, you know perspective will come. You'll know which way to go. Now, that's how it is with some people. They study the darkness. They study the problem. St head for the light. Head for where the word has been preached. And while you're sitting under the anointing and the word, light is coming. Answers are coming. The entrance of God's word brings light. Psalm 119. Amen. So, it's important that you maintain that. Don't think it's just... Oh, no, I don't feel like going. No, you press to go. The Bible says in Luke 5, they press to hear the word from Jesus. You must press to hear the word. Amen? So if people do not have faith, it's one of two things. Number one, the preacher is not preaching the word. He's not preaching on faith. He's preaching his opinion. He's preaching his experience. He's preaching theory, but he's not preaching the word. And God said, I will confirm my word with signs following, not your opinion. That is why as preachers, we don't preach our opinion. If you are a person in leadership, you don't preach your opinion. Stick with the word. Let the word fight its own fight. The word has its own authority. You don't need to defend the word. Just give the word and God will do the rest. He'll confirm his word with signs following, with miracles closely accompanying it. We don't need... So that is one reason why people don't have faith is because... People, preachers are not preaching on the word or faith. Number two, the second reason they might not have faith is because they're not paying attention when the preacher is preaching. You hear, but they, you're, you're thinking about the roast leg later. Ooh, what, what, what sauce is going to go with the roast leg? You see, you must be in the present moment. I mean, here's Martha and Mary. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus hearing his word. Martha is distracted with much serving. And she is now distracted. Instead of sitting at the feet of Jesus, she's concerned of who's going to cook for all Jesus and all his disciples in this house. And she, she should have just realized the miracle worker is right there. He just multiplied the fish and the loaves. He can multiply the food if he needs to. But what did she do? She let the thought pull her out of the presence of God. She let the thought pull her out of Jesus sitting right there and receiving answers and wisdom to her situation. And Mary chose to sit at his feet. And because she was distracted, now she's blaming Jesus for not caring and she's blaming her sister for not helping. When we are not in a good space spiritually, we start blaming God for not helping, uh, for not caring, and we start blaming other people for not helping. And Jesus said, no, 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 Martha, Martha. You must know if Jesus calls your name twice, you're in trouble. Martha, Martha, Mary not helping you is not your only problem. You worried and troubled about many things, Martha. One thing is needed. That's sit at my feet and hear my word. And once you sit at my feet, perspective will come. Wisdom will come. Answers will come. Peace will come. Forgiveness for other people will come. Sitting at his feet. Amen. I'm preaching. Amen. Are you here? So this next verse, like we keep, let's keep on reading Romans 10 verse 8. And now let's read verse 9. This is how you got saved. 
Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So for with the heart one believes, you believe with your heart. You don't believe with your head. I'm not talking about your physical organ, your heart. You can't believe with your physical organ, uh, or you can't believe with your kidneys or, or your lungs. I'm, it's talking about the center part of you, your spirit. For with your heart you believe unto righteousness, and with your mouth your confession is made unto salvation. Now that is the believing and confession of how to get saved. Well, the same will apply to anything. If you believe unto prosperity, and with your mouth you confess prosperity, it will become unto prosperity. If you believe unto healing and you confess I am healed, it will become unto healing. Whatever it is you need. It's faith. In order for faith to work, it must be in two places. It must be in your heart. It must be in your mouth. Then it works. And Jesus said to Brother Hagen, my people are not missing it primarily in the believing part. They're missing it in the sane part. They're not saying they're healed. They're not saying they're well. They keep speaking what they see in the natural. You and I must believe in our hearts and speak with our mouths what the word already said. Amen? So we believe, say, I believe with my heart and I speak with my mouth. So faith will work in your heart even with doubt in your head. Some of the greatest blessings have come into my life when I believed and my mind was reeling with doubt. But I said, no, I believe God. Like you will see, I read the scripture in Acts 27 today, I fall in the storm. I believe God that it will be even as it was told me. If he said it, I believe it, that settles it. In fact, if he said it, it's settled, it's time to believe it. Because we don't need to discuss whether God's word is true or not. It's true. We're the ones that must change, not God. God is always right. We're the ones who change. So it's settled, it's time to believe it. Amen? I mean, if you don't believe in gravity, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's working for you whether you like it or not. Just jump from there to from that stair to there. Gravity will work for you whether you believe it or not. The word is working whether you believe it or not. It works for those who put it to work. Amen? So faith can work. Some say, oh, no, I don't believe in this believing and speaking things. It just did. It just worked for you right now. You believed it in your heart. You said it doesn't work, and then it doesn't work. When people say, oh, nothing's happening. Oh, nothing's happening. Be careful what you say, because then nothing's going to happen. Say something good. Say that. Something good is going to happen to me today. Say it again. Something good is going to happen to me today. Now say this after me. Amen. In 2023... I will receive God's blessing because he is with me. Amen? He is with you. So there are many Christians who believe with their head. You call them mental assenters. They mentally assent or they mentally agree that that promise is true, but they don't believe it in their hearts. You and I must not just mentally agree, but believe it in your heart. Amen? So how do you know when they just agree or when the storm comes, when challenge comes, you need to act on the word. That's when we see, do you believe you said God is good? Now, why are you, why you, why are you falling to pieces? You, you believe God is good. You believe God is for you. Now, why are you falling to pieces? Because they agreed, they mentally know God is good. But when you believe it in your heart, no matter what's happening, you must know it in your knower. No matter what storm is happening, no matter how it shakes you, you keep believing, hey, God is good. Say, God is good. Amen. So you keep on believing. You keep on believing that God is good. So let's look at Thomas's faith, which is called head faith. And then we'll look at Abraham's faith, not today, which is called heart faith. You believe with your head, which was Thomas was believing with his head. Thomas was one of the 12 disciples. In John 20, verse 24 to 30, it says, now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
his will was involved. He made a decision, I'm not going to believe you. No matter what you tell me, I will not believe you. You see how our will is involved? You, you have to make a decision and bring your will in line with God's word. And say, I will believe this. Even though my mind is saying, I'm no good, I'm useless, I'm not forgiven. Say, no, I believe I'm forgiven. I believe I'm cleansed. I believe I'm righteous. I believe that the minute I became righteous, the minute I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's how you believe it. Amen. So he said, I will not believe. So his will was involved. He wanted to first touch and see and feel before he believed. But, but listen to what Jesus said. And after eight days, his disciples were gained inside and Thomas with him. Jesus came, the doors been shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. He immediately addressed his unbelief. Because unbelief can block you from receiving your miracle. Yeah, I know about that faith stuff. No, you watch out for that spirit of unbelief. That's continually trying to make us go against God, against his word, against what they say. Something you have, to, you have to come against that spirit of unbelief. That's trying to stop you from receiving. I'm telling you, you grow your faith through believing. This point is vital to how you receive from God. You have to believe. Jesus said, your believing has made you whole. Your believing has healed you. Your faith, your believing has done it. Then he said to Thomas, reach verse 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Or empowered to prosper are those who have not seen any evidence in the natural, but yet they believe me. They believe my word. They believe me. I'm telling you, those who believe God and live by faith and walk by faith, they walk in a higher realm of blessing than others normally do. Because they have to walk by something they can't see in the natural. But they also end up walking in great blessing and glory because of not first seeing and then believing. They believe even though God, they can't see it, they keep believing. Just look at the great wall of faith. Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, a whole chapter is dedicated to those who walk by faith. Faith is vital. That's why Hebrews 11, 6, 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The only thing that pleases God is faith. Why? Because for those, for it is impossible to please God, for those who come to God must believe that he exists and they must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You must believe the message says you must, they believe that God, they, God cares enough to respond to them. You must believe that God cares enough today for you to respond to you. Because the enemy wants to get in your mind. He wants to get in your mouth. He wants you to curse God and say, where's God? That's a sin he wanted Job to commit. Where is God? And then he couldn't come right with him. And then he came through his wife. And he said, why don't you just curse God and die? And he said, you're speaking like a foolish woman now. We will not. We will keep on believing God. And guess what happened? His faith in God gave him double for all his trouble. Isn't that amazing? Get ready, get ready. God's going to restore and give you double for all your trouble. Amen? Double. And I mean, Job never had a bad life. The way they speak of the book of Job, the whole study of the book of Job is one year. His whole life. Job had a bad year. He never had a bad life. Wait, some people talk like they're always in a Job experience. If you say you're in a Job experience, then you must come out double at the end. Amen? But I'm telling you, no matter what you're dealing with today, have faith in God. Amen? Have faith in God. So empower to prosper those who believe without first seeing evidence. You have to see it with the eye of faith. We have six eyes. Uh, the third eye. The eye of faith. You must believe. Amen? So look at how Paul believed in the midst of the storm. Let's look at Acts 27. We'll end with this passage. Verse 9 and 10, it says, Now when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. So Paul was saying, guys, I have an inward witness. I have an unction. 
I have a nudge in my spirit that this trip now is going to end with disaster and much loss. Please, let's not go on this trip. And I want to say to you this morning, as a child of God, listen to me. Don't ever violate and ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit when he nudges you. Not to go somewhere, not to do something, not to get involved with someone. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit knows everything. He knows our future and he knows everything. Don't ever violate that. Because that's there for your protection. And I want to jump from that passage. We'll come back to the verse again. But I want to jump to 1 John 2, 20, verse 20 to 27. And I want to show you as a child of God how God's given you his anointing to guide you on a daily basis and to protect you from the wrong people and wrong things. Verse 20 of 1 John 2 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. Say, I know all things. Stop saying, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's amazing how some I just can't understand. I can't understand. I'm so confused. Look how they keep saying, I don't know. I can't understand. No wonder they keep not understanding the work that is given to them. Because they keep saying, I can't understand. I can't understand. I don't know. I'm so confused. That is not what you must be saying. You must say, I know all things. I have an anointing from the Holy One and I know all things. Faith agrees with the word. I know all things. I know what to do in this situation. I know what to do. I know which direction to take. I know what decision to make. I know, I know. I have, Lord, thank you for giving me understanding of this situation right now. I believe I receive understanding. Help me, God, to understand. Not I don't understand. Help me to understand what you just said now. That's what you say to them. Help me to understand. Amen. Oh, I'm so confused. People say, oh, you, you, after you preached that word, you confused me. No, no, no. When you came here, you were confused. The word showed you how confused you were. And then it delivered you from your confusion if you will yield to the light of God's word. But God's word brings light. It doesn't bring confusion. Amen. Say amen, pastor. Verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lies of the truth. So say, I know the truth. So I want to show you particularly, pay attention to the word lie, liars, uh, deceiving, deception, because I want to show you how the anointing will protect you from liars. For those of us who grew up in the ghetto from twisters. Amen. Amen. <laughs> manipulators. It will protect you from the wrong people and the wrong situations. No sign here. If you walk by the anointing, it will protect you from scams and scammers. If you will just take the time to listen and not be so in a hurry and just listen. Ooh. Amen. I mean, so I, <laughs> many years ago when Pastor Lorna and I were living with my sister, went home to be with the Lord, her and her husband were having a fight there. So he wasn't living really with her. We were living with her. He was living at his own home and so forth. And they're fighting and she's, they're arguing over their marriage, their fi finances, whatever. And she says, Lorna, Lester, please pray. Please pray here in the room. Wow. You know, please pray for us. And so she... And they arguing, and he's now mad with her because you want more money. And, they, and then she's saying words, and then he says to her, listen. He said, no, Abigail, you're trying to twist me like a co-sister. <laughs> you're not going to twist me like a co-sister. <laughs> Amen. So oh, that's all you, and we're laughing. And we tell her, she said, I thought you were interceding in the room. You were laughing about twist me like a co-sister. Watch out for twisters. Verse 22, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Who is a liar? Satan. Satan is the father of lies. He's the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the liar. So we don't listen to him and his lies today about your spouse, about your children, about your family, about people. You don't listen to that lies. Who is a liar? Satan. And I want to encourage you, those of you who feel it's permissible to tell white lies, soon you will grow colorblind. Stop telling white lies. Let your, it's black or it's white. It's right or it's wrong. Amen. Oh, no, it's just a white lie, Pastor. Ooh, white lies give access to the devil. He is the father of lies. Tell the truth. Amen. It's got quiet now. Yeah, in this. Amen. So, 
Whoever has, verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and, the fa and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. These things I have written to you because to, to written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Those who try to lead you astray. The anointing will protect you from those who are trying to lead you into wrong places and wrong things. Verse 27, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you. That is not talking about you don't need teachers in the body of Christ. God gave the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher for the equipping of the saints. They need to be equipped. You can't equip yourself. You need the fivefold ministry to help you. God has anointed them and given them as gifts to the body of Christ to equip the body of Christ. So it's not talking about you don't need anyone to teach you. What it's referring to here is on your daily walk with God. You don't need somebody to teach you every time. The anointing in you will teach you. No, no, don't sign here. Something is not right here. I don't know about this person. I don't know why, but something is not right. The anointing is protecting you there. Listen to it. Don't violate it. Don't push. Don't force. Listen. It's unctioning you and letting you know something's not right. But what is it? I don't, listen, I don't need to know why in order to obey the Holy Spirit. All I have to do is obey. I don't need to know why. So let's see there again. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you. Concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. I'm encouraging you, child of God. You will be in a safe place, in a protected place. If you just take the time to listen to God, and the anointing that is placed inside of you will teach you concerning, it will protect you from the wrong people, wrong places, dangerous situations. And you're going to see now in the storm how the anointing was protecting Paul and the rest of them from a dangerous situation. And you'll see how that applied to us, how we can learn from that. Verse 11, nevertheless, so Paul says, guys, I have a witness that this trip is not going to be great. Verse 11 says, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded, or that is um, Paul's guard, security guard that has taken him to Rome. The centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. So he was saying, listen, this, the, the centurion was more persuaded. He he was listening more to the owner of the ship and the pilot of the ship, the driver. And they probably said, hey, man, this, what does this preacher know about the seas? We know about the sea. We live on the sea. We navigate the waters every day. It's going to be okay. Let's go. And we can move. You see, you have to be very careful that you don't allow pride to set in and think, oh, no. We, we don't need to listen. You must listen. You know what I mean? So, so they had experience, but listen to me, experience is not a leading. Experience is not a leading. Check your spirit. Paul had inside information. He had inside his spirit information. Verse 12, and because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail. The majority was also wrong. You're going to see now when I read the passage. So the majority is not always right. Majority is not a leading. Check your spirit. We are spirit-led people. We're not money-led. We don't go because there's more money. No, we're not money-led. We're not head-led. We're not experience-led. We're not majority-led. We are spirit-led people. And spirit-led people will be in a safe place all the time. Amen. So, we are spirit-led people. I know even of a... a I... A, the Holy Spirit was reminding me, and I discovered something. Do you know what a Ponzi scheme is? Let me tell you what a Ponzi scheme is. Ponzi is P-O-N-Z-I-E. And it comes from, it was named after a businessman in the 1920s named Charles Ponzi. And he was a twister. He took people's money. <laughs> Let me read it to you. So a Ponzi scheme is a form of fraud that lures investors and pays profits to early investors with funds from more recent investors. So say, for example, these three uh, guys uh, invest 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. 
and they get promised that in three months' time, I'm going to give you 15,000, 15,000, 15,000. They say, wow, what a great deal. So they give their 10,000, but he also asked for that 10,000, that 10,000, that 10,000 all over. So by the time their three months is up, he takes 15,000 of that money and he gives it to them. And they start saying, whoa, this thing is working, guys. I'm going to invest more. So they invest another 20,000 each and they tell other people it's working. And so they also invest until it, it goes to such a, a huge amount. And so listen what it says. It says, the scheme leads victims to believe that profits are coming from legitimate business activity. And it's not coming from there. It's coming from, uh, like maybe they think it, it's coming from sales and products and services. But it's coming from the other investors' money to pay you. And so they remain unaware that other investors are the source of funds. A Ponzi scheme can maintain the illusion of a sustainable business as long as new investors contribute new funds and as long as most of the investors do not demand full repayment and still believe in the non-existent assets they are alleged to own. That's what a Ponzi scheme is. And I know of many people years ago, and maybe you were one of them, who invested in a Ponzi scheme. And many people lost money. They took out bonds. We, we had to counsel people through it. They took out bonds. They took out loans. They, other people, I know of a guy that invested m a million and many other people, and the whole thing collapsed after a year or two. It fell flat on its face. And SARS froze all the assets and it was trouble. And I know the guy, he's such a good guy, minister to him personally, even before, during, after. And you know what? Pastor Lone and I thought, oh, we need to get involved with this. It's happening. The majority is investing. But in my spirit, we both knew we don't have a piece to do this. We just don't have a piece to sow, uh, to invest in this and so forth. And eventually it, it collapsed. So I'm saying to you, the anointing will protect you. If you just take the time to listen and obey quickly. Amen. Follow and obey the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. Verse 12 says, And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also. If by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. So they didn't want to winter in the harbor called where they were. They wanted to winter in by the harbor called Crete. So it was not suitable. In other words, it was not comfortable. It means that their plans were going to have to change. And it was going to be too much inconvenience. So they began to push and to shove and to force. And I want to say to you this morning, don't push and don't force things when you see God is closing a door for you. Now you have to, you can't go by doors. You have to check your spirit. Because what if four doors is saying, Four doors open. You must know in your spirit which door to go through. So you can't say, Lord, open that door. Because the enemy might open the door for you. Because he operates in the natural. You have to check your spirit. The door might be open and God says, don't go through. Or the door might be closed and God says, kick that door down by faith that is yours. Go in and possess it. You see, you have to check your spirit. So I'm saying to you this morning, don't push and don't force and don't... Make, because when you force, you might get what you want, but you're also going to sit with consequences that you didn't want. Amen. Make sure you're dating the right person. Make sure you're going uh, to the right place. Make sure you're going into business with the right people. Check your spirit. Amen. Sometimes they look cute on the outside. Oh, yeah, his legs so cute. Yeah, but after a few months and they start spitting out green stuff. Make me a sandwich. And they become ugly. Ooh, I thought you're so cute. Yeah, you didn't check your spirit. It was warning you not to go there. Amen. <laughs> if the Lord shuts the door, don't try and jump in through the window. Verse 13, and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they ob obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. So the south wind is blowing soft. They're thinking, praise the Lord, it's happening. The south wind, all is well, all is good. Everything is going well. But Paul said, this voyage will end with disaster and much loss. Not start, end. And many times people make decisions based on what the weather is now, right now, like. They don't see in three hours time where they're going, what the weather is going to be like. You have to watch your spirit. Amen. I've got a few 
more seconds. Let me just finish here. Verse 14, but not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let it drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the certain stands, they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed or storm-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, you'll read in the passage, it was 14 days. They were in no sun, no stars, in a storm. And no small tempest beat on us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Paul said that. So that tells me there are certain disasters and loss that we can avoid if we just take the time to listen. They didn't have to go through that storm. They didn't have to experience all that disaster and loss if they took the time to listen. Listen to your pastors. Listen to your parents. Listen to those in authority that have wisdom. Listen to God when he speaks. Amen. They could have avoided it. Now listen to me, I'm, I'm going to sew you up now, it's going to get good. I'm just closing it up. But listen, being in the right place is where your protection and prosperity are. And a lot of your prosperity is, what is in what you don't have to spend. The sicknesses you don't have, the lawsuits you don't have, and the divorces you don't have. You don't have expenses from the accidents that you don't have, and it goes on and on and on. A lot of us don't know how prosperous we are. There's so much we didn't have to spend and go th and pay and go through in the past year or two or five or ten. Why? Because when you are where you're supposed to be, you are protected. That's a big part of your prosperity. Amen. Praise God. But listen, it gets good. Listen to what Paul says, verse 22. And amen. This is good news. There's no, and if you missed it, I've missed it sometimes, many times I've missed it. But there's no condemnation. Amen. All you have to do is repent. All you have to do is turn around. All you have to do, because God is the great rectifier. He's the great changer. He's the great one of grace that can turn your mistakes for your good. And verse 22 says, and now I urge you to take heart, Paul is saying, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Amen. He knew who he was, this man. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. In other words, this, Paul, this storm can't take you out. You have an assignment with Caesar. You, this nothing can take you out. You have to fulfill your assignment. When you are in the place where you're supposed to be, the devil can't touch you. Indeed, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. The rest of them also got saved because of one man's obedience. Therefore, take heart, men. Listen, listen, for I believe God. That it will be just as it was told me. Say that. I believe God. That it will be just as it was told me. Amen. You grow your faith by believing the word. By believing what God says. So faith still works in the middle of the storm. Listen, the storm may blow, but the faith walk continues. The storm may blow, but the faith walk continues. It, and it works in the middle of the storm, your faith. Amen. So let's close off with this verses, verse 33. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. They were all encouraged and also took food themselves. Now they got his attention. No prate, no whirler. Yeah, okay, Paul, shame. Okay, sorry, man. Yes, whatever. Yes, you understand. Sometimes when people go through, and in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. We. That's talking about Luke. Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts. And he wrote the gospel of Luke. He was a medical doctor. 
And he traveled with Paul and documented. And he said, we in all, we were 276 persons that were saved because of one man's obedience. It pays to obey God. It pays to believe God. It pays to listen to God. It pays to stand when others are, are giving up hope. It pays to believe God. And I want to say to you this morning, no matter what storm you're facing or going through right now, keep believing God. God's promise still stands. If he said it, that settles it. It's time to believe it. We keep believing. Jesus said to Martha at the tomb, he said to her, Martha, did I not say if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. If you will believe, it don't matter even if a situation looks dead in the natural, your believing will resurrect that situation. It will bring you back into restoration of whatever you believe in God for. So today, as we close this morning, I want to encourage you, don't give up, child of God. Don't give up. Let me close with a scripture, Romans 4, 17, the message. When everything looked, looked hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. When everything looks hopeless in your life today, believe anyway. Do you know that it takes the same amount of time to be in faith as it does to be in unbelief? So you might as well spend the time believing. Because it takes the same amount of time. When everything looked hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Keep believing, child of God. Keep believing up for your child. Keep believing for that business turnaround. Keep believing for restoration in your marriage. Keep believing that you will see your dream come to pass and the fulfillment of what God promised you. Keep believing. Because with God, all things are possible. And all things are possible to those who believe. It's not can I do it, it's can you believe it. When that man said, Jesus, if you can, you can heal my son. He said, no, not if I can. If you can believe, I can do what you believe for. God can do it. So this morning, come, let's stand. I want to pray for you. And I want to just trust God with you. Amen. That faith is working in the middle of the storm. Even though the storm is blowing, the faith will continue. And I know many of you are really trusting God and it's been a while. Just yield to God. The first thing you must do is don't carry the burden. Don't carry the care. Cast the care over on the Lord because He cares for you. That's the first thing you do. Don't sit with that burden. I don't care how urgent it is, how it looks right now. It might be in your face, that situation. Don't react, respond by giving the care the burden, the worry, the problem, give it to God. Your job is to believe God can do His job. Give it to God and let God do His job. So raise your hand this morning. Close your eyes. Father, I pray for your precious people, those who are going through a storm this morning, those who are trusting you for a supernatural turnaround. Father God, we believe with them for a supernatural turnaround in their lives today. Oh God, with you all things are possible. We pray, Father God, that you'll strengthen people and make them bold with strength in their souls today. That they will not quit. That they will not give up. That they will not draw back. That they will not faint. That they will not lose heart. That they will keep on believing. Because you are good God. Even when they, we cannot trace you, we can trust you. We keep on believing God. So today I pray that you fill people with hope today. Fill them with joy. Those who feel hopeless, God. Even when everything looks hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. I pray, God, when everything in the natural looks hopeless, I ask you today that you, the God of hope, will fill your people today with joy and fill them with peace in believing and that they will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we know hopelessness sets in when we prayed and we fasted and we gave and we stood and we, we cried out and we still haven't seen results. But today I'm asking you to fill people with hope again with believing again because God you were good God and I thank you for a supernatural turnaround in people's lives their marriages their businesses their finances healing for their bodies in the name of Jesus I command people's bodies to be healed right now I command people's finances to be to be 
turned around and restored right now. I command marriages and family and children to be restored in the name of Jesus. We take authority over you, Satan. We rebuke the storm that is coming against God's people. I speak to that storm and I say, peace, be still in the name of Jesus. And I command you to stop and desist in your maneuvers, devil. I command you to take your hands off our congregation and our ministry partners and every person present and online. You take your hands off them and their family. We cast you out in the name of Jesus. And in his name, you must leave. And right now, Father, I pray for supernatural peace to be upon your people. That they will experience your peace that surpasses all understanding. That it will keep their hearts and minds. Father God, if we missed it and we, we, we didn't listen, and now we're in a storm because of our own mess up, thank you that you, we repent this morning. Forgive us, Father. We repent. We ask you to have mercy on us. Have mercy on our family. Have mercy because of our disobedience. But today we repent and we thank you that you the great rectifier, the great changer, the great one of grace that will turn people's mistakes for their good right now. I thank you for supernatural turnarounds in the name of Jesus. That's what I'm getting right now. The favor of God, the blessing of God right now is bringing about supernatural turnarounds for you and your family. It's not going to be the way it's always been. It's not going to be the way it's always been. All is well in the household of faith. All is well in your household. We believe that, Lord. We receive it. Come on, use your faith now and agree with that and just say, Lord, I believe that. I receive it. I believe I receive my supernatural turnaround. I believe I receive my turnaround in my finances, my marriage, my family, my business my employment, my health. I believe I receive a supernatural turnaround right now in the name of Jesus.